Hello, everyone, and welcome to our season finale of How to Buy Your First Dental Practice. I have my good friend, personal dental focus attorney, Philadelphia fan, Rob Montgomery with me. You're going to hear from him in just a second. But if you're joining us here on Facebook, you can ask questions in the comments. Joining us on Zoom, he asks questions in the comments. We have awesome questions for Rob. Uh, Rob and I have known each other well before the Facebook days. That time existed back in 2010. So, Rob, really appreciate you being here. Just orient our audience to who you are, what you do on your daily in your daily life as a dental focused attorney. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Sure. It's nice to be in the room with you. Yeah, yeah, right. For a change. Right together. Um, not doing a Zoom webinar yeah. for so we should have got something stronger for Cheers here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe I'll come back to the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what we do is help dentists with their legal business issues. Uh, but a very important and, and substantial aspect of our practice is helping people transition into practice ownership, either through startups or even more so frequently. Uh, practice acquisitions. And, and I'm glad you brought that up on this season. You know, I'm a, I've told the audience what I do, practice broker, Dr. Nacho, Dennis and Human. I know I'm kind of on this acquisition side, both personally in my professional life and as a broker, but startups are part of it too. In your business, do you see like 50-50 startups, 25% startups, 75% acquisitions? Where do you guys see that? Uh, maybe, you know, this is a number that I mean, it's not tested, but yeah. I, I get the sense that it's probably 60, 40 acquisitions to start. Gotcha. So it's kind of important for our audience to realize that starting your own dental practice part of it too. And we're going to dig into some of the questions here. But when you start up your own dental practice, like to deliver this value up front, should you DIY it, Rob, or should you get some people to help you? It is never a good idea to DIY things. Right? Like not in this world. It's, as we talk about, Paul, often in different contexts, in different places, these are one transaction for the most part for most people. And um, this is not one you want to learn from. And I say the most poignant and genuine way possible, because I know you work with sellers too. It's not a judgmental way, but the end of a dentist's career, they may have had more than one spouse, more than one house, but still just that one dental practice. And it shows how that's consistent throughout their life. So uh, mm -hmm. what we like to do is answer great questions. Dental school doesn't cover just like our podcast, the Dental Amigos. We're on the Dental Amigos uh, coming back. We have over 70 episodes you can enjoy on some summer trips to the beach. So why does a buyer need to be very careful when working with a dual representation broker? What does a dual representation broker mean to you and why is caution so important? Well, Paul, as I like to say, dual representation equals no representation. Right. Um, it's a dual representative broker is really not working for either side, even though they're saying, hey, I'm gonna represent you as the buyer, I'm representing the seller. That's really you know, a fallacy. Um, it's they're representing the deal. They're doing right. what they need to do to get paid and get a commission. And look, whether you're talking about a dual representation broker or even a, a broker that just represents a seller in a deal, right. I think it's important to understand and recognize what their role is in the transaction. Right. Their role is to put a buyer and a seller together and to facilitate the deal. It's not to give legal advice. It's not to give accounting advice. It's certainly not to give advice to the other side. You know, they are facilitators. And, and so I think where people may run into trouble sometimes is that they expect the broker to do more than what they're doing. Right. They expect the broker to be a substitute for hiring a CPA or to be a substitute for hiring a lawyer. And that's frankly not necessarily the broker's fault, right. whether it's a, a seller representative broker or a dual represent, uh, representative broker. It's the fault of the person that, that misunderstands what their role is. And I think we always have props here. It's part of the team, right? My dream is to play professional basketball. We've talked about center, forwards, guards, Rob. So people often ask you to get outside your lane in dentistry. So I want to share this. You know, they ask me to get outside my lane as a general dentist and say, come on, can't you extract my, extract my wisdom tooth? And a general dentist says, no way I can do that. You work with great oral surgeons because that's just what they do. So where does staying in your lane come into play for you on a daily basis? Where do people maybe ask you things outside your lane and how do you work with your network? I mean, we shut that down pretty quickly. We tell people we're doing the legal work here. And so if somebody asks us to take a look at a, uh, an evaluation or give them financial advice, I tell them, okay, that's great. Let's get a call with your CPA right. and go over those numbers. Uh, and we do counsel people and say, hey, this is something that you need to talk to your accountant about. But, and, and we can be a party to that right. conversation, but we're not the ones getting And this is just like our world in dentistry. We say, hey, you need to see a root canal specialist, an endodontist, mm -hmm. to determine if this tooth is even restorable before we do these things. And that's where you might say, you need to work with a dental-focused CPA to maybe look at this problem. You've helped me, Rob, in knowing that the dental-focused CPA is important. So now I'm going to ask you, you know, you're making the starting five. It's kind of a sore point. The 76 is not a good year for them. But you're making a team. Who should be on this team? And I'll also add two, but like you're thinking in your daily 
dental focus on it. Who is on this transition team for your, your buyers? I mean, the big, big roles are the, the CPA and, and the lawyer. Uh, depending on the deal or the client, they may have a financial planner uh, involved in the deal as well. They're going to need to talk to somebody who uh, can help them with their insurance needs. Right. They're definitely going to need a lender. You know, sure. They need Let's money. pause on the lending for a minute because I always say the bank is the mom of the deal. When we grew up, your mom said, this is not a good idea. You can't do it. So when should these buyers or where do you see them? When do they connect with the bank in the timeline? And how many banks do you see most of your buyers connecting with on a deal to kind of see which one's best? Uh, I mean, I would say you know, two to three lenders probably make sense. And you're going to see different deals, different terms uh, from lender to lender, especially how the deals are, are structured. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes beyond interest rate. Obviously, interest rate is one thing that you have to look at, but what is uh, what is the term of the loan? How many years are you repaying? Is it going to be a, a period of time in which you're only paying interest? Uh, and that's important because not all banks are created equal, and they're not even always the right person for that deal. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone you know, is just popping in now and saying, why don't they want to go to Joe's bank down the street and get these deals done or even ask them, or maybe why will Joe's bank even not even want to do the deal? Well, I mean, to me, there are local banks that will finance deals. They're out there. There might be unicorns in the world right. too. Yeah. You know? yeah. So how much time do you want to spend yeah. looking for, for, the, uh, for the unicorns? Uh, but if you're working with a bank, ultimately a local bank or a bank that isn't sort of a proven uh, lender in the space, you're going to probably be wasting a lot of time and ultimately you're going to run into a dead end right. where you now the clock is ticking. We have an asset purchase agreement about the sign, the sign, we're talking about closing and you're working with a bank that's still fiddling around right. with the deal. And look, lenders and the sales or and the loan officers, they're salespeople. Right. Uh, so if you walk into a bank branch and say, hey, I'd like to borrow a million dollars, the person you'd say that to is going to try to find a way for you to borrow a million dollars, you know, and, and, and they're going to, go to great lengths internally than their organization trying to make that happen. But, you know, it just may not be realistic. And so uh, I think it's good to work with the people that have a proven track record. Sometimes we're talking about local or regional banks that have a proven track record, right. and that's okay. Um, and as far as when, uh, I think that you know, when you know you want to buy a practice or do a startup, that's a good time to reach out, start those relationships so that these lenders know who you are, keep them up to date. Hey, um, I'm ready now. I'm submitting uh, some, some letters of intent on a couple of deals, see what's going right. to come back. What are you going to need from me? So that the lender says, yeah, well, we're going to need you know, three years of tax returns and these financials and these other reports. Well, great. And as part of the due diligence process, you know, when you're evaluating the deal uh, with your CPA or whoever right. you're your consultant is that's helping you evaluate the, the practice, that these are things that you need to ask for because among other things, you're going to have to get them to the bank. It's so key up too. It's like, it's like this homework project for the biggest decision in your life. And I, that's how I judge as a broker, how kind of ready a buyer is when I say, uh, I know you like this practice, it, but have you talked to a bank? And they say, not yet. And it's always a red flag in the momentum of the deal mm -hmm. because bankers are people too, just like all of us, and they have other clients. Sure. So I think that's a really great tip is that when you're thinking about this, start connecting with banks because there's things that you can do outside of having a practice on the table, mm -hmm. just getting your per personal financial statement. So we talk yeah. a lot about being realistic in this field. So we talk about things that are, are opportunities, things that are challenges. You know, so one of the things that I've learned from you is, you know, these banks, someone could have $600,000 in debt and want to buy a million dollar practice. And the bank says, great, mm -hmm. just talk about that for a minute because you've done me a great job as my own personal owner is show it and showing when to be optimistic, when to pull back. But really, if, if a dentist is saying, I'm $600,000 in debt, does that stop them from buying a practice? I don't think so. Now, 600, that's a, that's a big number, Paul. Yeah, so, uh, yes. yeah, maybe, you know, now you're starting to get into a place that may be a problem. But in part, it's a problem because the monthly payment to service that debt is starting to become yeah. pretty high. And that's what the banks are really looking at. They're looking at cash flow. They're looking at what your student debt is, what your rent and mortgage payment is, what your car payment is how much you're paying the credit card companies that they're looking at it from a cash flow standpoint, because they want to know that you can afford to pay the loan right. on a monthly basis. Yeah. And, they, and that's why you, you shared one of your, I think earliest clients or maybe early, early client had overpaid a lot of their, their loans mm -hmm. and didn't have enough cash flow. So one of the tips I pointed out to thank you is save 10% in non-retirement assets. So the bank thinks you're a good risk. Us dentists, I am one and lawyers by the same way. 
overachievers don't like debt and say, hey, I'm going right. to take every extra dollar. I'm going to eat ramen noodles. Not that they're so bad ramen noodles. We eat ramen noodles. But then if you don't have any money saved, that's another golden nacho tip from this is take part of that. Now, yeah. um, buildings, right? Should a dentist insist and say, I will not buy a practice without the building. Should they rent? Should they lease? You have helped me understand the excitement of leases. Tell our audience a little bit about that. I think that owning the dental office real estate is one of the most overrated aspects of the dental business world. Tell us why. Tell us your why. Well, first and foremost, you know, this is an investment. It's a commercial real estate investment. Now, when you own the, 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 the real estate where you practice, first of all, if it, let's just assume that it's a single tenant building. So there's no other cash flow from other commercial tenants or residential tenants. It's just you in this building. Uh, that's typically not the type of commercial real estate right. asset that has a big audience, a big market of buyers. So really, in that instance, once you own your dental office real estate, the, the main buyer that you have is the person that's going to buy your, your practice. And Paul, yeah. you and I did a uh, uh, seminar a couple of years ago where we had a say a spirited debate with somebody in the audience that kept saying, yeah, but Rob, I have a built-in buyer for my real estate. It's the person that buys my practice. Yeah, that's great. You have one buyer in the world. Yeah. Who wants to own an asset where there's right. one potential buyer? It makes it that, that asset very illiquid. The other practical reality is how do you, if you want to sell it before you sell right. your practice, you could say, well, you know what, I'm 55, I, you know, I'd like to buy a second home and, you know, geez, I would, you know, we can rent it out, we can Airbnb, we can spend a month of the year there. Doesn't so sounds great. Well, let's just sell our building. To who? Right. Like, exactly. You can't sell the building in this practice because then where are you going to practice? I mean, again, you could probably sell it to a dentist, but if you're not ready to sell exactly. the practice too. So, you know, I find that really, I think it's a very illiquid asset and you're really kind of chaining yourself to this particular situation. And I, I don't like it. A lot of times we'll have conversations with buyers. They'll say, well, I want to hold the real estate. I don't want to sell it to this dentist because I want the cash flow. Great. Sell it to the dentist, take the money and go buy some right. yeah. real estate that actually yes. has a market that, you know, that's something that's liquid. You buy a, a small strip center, a multifamily building, an apartment building, something that you could sell to a, a larger audience of potential buyers right. at a time of your choosing. Being a specialized dental buyer makes things very complicated. I've gotten poignant calls from people saying, we wanted to keep my dad's building and now nobody, with a big move to practice and now nobody wants to buy it. So yeah. I think that's such a point is don't get caught up on this. It's nice to have if it works. I'm in a scenario where one, we own real estate where we rent, we rent and lease from another place. So it's such a good point to say, don't get caught up. Buy your dental practice is the most important thing. That's the investment. Like you said, if you like real estate, you just go invest in real estate elsewhere in a, in a, in a a way that makes a lot more sense. Maybe you have multifamily homes, maybe you have other things like that, not just this one thing. Great point. But one other thing to keep in mind too, that what we see, Paul, in the transition world, most DSOs aren't interested in buying the real estate. Right, yes. So again, that's something else. If your plan is to sell the real estate ultimately to the buyer of your practice, they may just flat out not be interested, but take a cue from them. They know that you're not making money off of the dirt. Right. They've yes. got a pot of money that they can spend in ways that are going to have a return on that investment. Yeah. And they're not sinking it in the real estate. They're buying more dental practice. So such a point. That's just something that needs to be brought to light is first work with good advisors because Rob has brought people on our podcast who dug into leases because leases. Now we'll talk about buying. Now just take a minute and talk about, okay, I'm not going to buy my, my building. I don't have an option to buy it, but where can dentists burn their nachos with leases? Where have you seen crazy things in leases? And besides your dental focus attorney, who are some other people they should kind of be connected with in this process? Yeah, so in, in the leasing world, obviously you need a good dental focus, dental experienced realtor to help yeah. you with that, that aspect of things. They're very good startup consultants as well um, that, you know, that, that you can work with. Uh, I think that some of the provisions that we see, the gotchas, and these things are kind of counterintuitive for a lot of people. You don't want to sign a lease that has a relocation provision in there which right. means that the landlord can move you to another place in the, in the shopping center or a building. Um, and what that looks like economically for you all depends on what right. the lease says, you know, how much notice they have to give you, how, how much uh, does that have to reimburse you for your costs, your relocation costs, um, who's going to build out the right. new space. So that's one. Yeah. The other thing is you want to have good assignment language so that when it comes time to sell your practice, 
you're able to transfer the lease to the buyer with as little landlord approval and involvement as possible. You don't want to give the landlord a seat at the table. Love that. Just say, because you, I'm using, you don't want to give the landlord a seat at the table in your big transition. Mm -hmm. You've seen this happen in ways that have not worked out well or ways that have been problematic. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially in a distressed situation where you have a dog that's sick or disabled, where time is everything. We find a buyer and then the landlord says, well, yeah, you know, unlike the dental banking world that says you got five hundred thousand dollars of student debt come on up you know we'll give you a loan <laughs> yes you tell the commercial landlord that this person has five hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of assets they say are you serious that you right. want us to to take on this tenant with a negative three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of net worth right. like we're not going to do that deal so you know the, what you want to do and, and this is a planning thing the better language you get when you sign the lease, the likelihood of you being able to transition the practice and the lease together is going to be enhanced. And then we made really some great points. And also, I know my dentist people, Rob, maybe lawyers like this too. They like to save money. They're frugal. Where's this magical opportunity when you're buying a, a when you're buying a practice? And taking over a lease, can the new buyer actually negotiate a lower amount for the lease than the previous buyer? Tell us a little bit about that. It depends. You know, it really depends how much time is left on the yeah. lease. You know, if you have a year left on the lease and the buyer's coming in saying, hey, you know what, I, I want a, a nine-year extension with two five-year renewal options, because that's what the lender is going to require too. Everybody's buying lease. You don't want to buy a practice where you can be, you know, a uh, dental office homeless right. and, you know, in a year or two. So you're going to have to extend that lease. When you're going to the landlord in that situation with the offer to uh, extend the lease for a substantial amount of time, You've got some leverage to uh, negotiate power. We, you've had Brian Madden car, their sponsors on, mm -hmm. and some of the work they do. They basically, they basically find out if you're getting the best deal you can get. Is mm -hmm. that true? Because yes. You kind of told me. You've told me. I mean, maybe I, I've, I've fallen. But it's like people think their landlord's nice, right? By like doing this, but behind the scenes, they may have given another tenant in the in the spot a better deal than you, even though you've been with them for 20 years. Absolutely, and that goes to something that that I say when I'm talking to people that are considering startups. You know, and, and leases never call the name on the side. You know, you as tempting it. as it is, I'm driving by. It's a Friday afternoon. I'm coming home from the golf course. I see the location, and you know, it looks really cool. And there's a name and a, and a telephone number. I can't wait. I have to call and see what the deal is. That's a really bad idea because then it makes it very difficult for you to get your own realtor involved, who's able to actually give you advice and tell you what the market is and what kind of rent, what kind of tenant improvement allowance to get, yeah. what kind of free rent period. Now you just put yourself out on this island by yourself. And frankly, landlords are going to give that person a very different deal than they're going to give right. to the person that they know is represented because they, they're not going to be able to get away with that, with a, with a, a good uh, a good experience. And that's a great one. I want you to also share, we have a great uh, text code from my amigo Rob, just text law to 215-543-6454. Rob has helped me with, and his awesome team has helped me with employment contracts, asset purchase agreements. We'll spend another few minutes talking here you want but your theme here Rob has been get the right team to protect you prepare you and aware you because you have when bad deals happen to good dentists which is something I ask you to do right. some bad stories from people right on these sure. things so you've got to get the right team around now um let's just bring I talk a lot about acronyms JBN just be nice things like that so tell us just some basic things what is a letter of intent if someone said hey Rob you're on a game show tell us what a letter of intent does for this what does a LOI mean and what does it do yeah, so that's really just capturing sort of the big picture business terms of the deal. Um, there may be some legal issues in there. You might talk about a covenant not to compete. Um, you may talk about what the rental rate is going to be, if there's going to be a lease involved or the seller's holding on to the real estate, if the seller is going to stay on and provide services after the closing. We might talk about the compensation, right? Um, the period of time in which they're going to stay on. Um, we're talking about the purchase price. So this LOI, and I've learned a lot of you, why don't you want to just print one off the internet and not use an attorney? What can an attorney do in the LOI to set the tone for this? Because I've learned through some of my challenging transitions with you helping us, you know, they don't like what's in the LOI. They're probably not going to like what the next thing coming next. So share with us, you know, not because it's your dental lawyer.com, but why do you want a professional to help you make the LOI? Right. So what are the, the, the common sort of, you know, misconceptions with the LOI? And it's somewhat true is, I don't have to worry about the LOI because it's not binding, right? That just means that you know, if one of the parties doesn't 
follow through with the transaction, then the other one can't sue them. Okay, <laughs> great. We don't really want to be talking in those terms anyway. But the reality is, if there are things that are in the LOI or not in the LOI, right. when we get to the next stage, it gets very hard to change those things. It's very hard to right. put the genie back in the bottle. So even though you know somebody can't get sued for the deal not closing, that doesn't mean that we're not going to end up in some sort of impasse right. or, or a place that you don't want to be because you agreed to a two-year, 10-mile non-compete when you should have asked the seller for a five-year, 20-mile. Right. But I always say, because uh, you know my awesome daughters, I never accidentally say we might get ice cream because the second I say we're getting ice cream, my three-year-old, we're getting ice cream. It's the yeah. same thing here. Don't say stuff you try to walk back later in this people transition because we both have used this. The dental offices are people places, not pizza places. Mm -hmm. You're transitioning the person. You're buying the goodwill of the seller. Now then, uh, APA, what does APA stand for and what? why is that such a... I guess probably one of the biggest documents a dentist is ever going to sign in his or her life. Yeah, I mean, that's the asset purchase agreement. Um, that's where the document that that, uh, that, that captures the, the practice transition, yeah. where you're buying the practice. There are different ways to structure sales of businesses and practices. You can do it as an asset purchase where you're just buying the assets. You're not right. taking on any of the liabilities. Or you could do it as a stock purchase, where essentially you step into the shoes of the person that owned it before you. Stock purchases are very rare in this context. The gotcha. overwhelming majority, 99 plus percent of the time, we're looking at an asset purchase agreement. And some of those terms that we talked about in the LOI are also going to be in the asset purchase agreement, right. but they're going to be fleshed out a little bit more. There's going to be more detail. Um, you know, Does the employment agreement come with the APA as kind of a sidecar, like the motorcycle sidecar? So basically, I know a lot of people are thinking, should the seller stand and work? The seller wants to stand and work. Now you're buying a practice and you have to deliver an employment agreement to mm -hmm. the other dentist. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the APA usually as well, That those expectations? Yeah, I mean, that gets negotiated with the APA. So you negotiate the, the APA and the employment agreement at the same time. And then the APA would say, attached here too is exhibit A. Yeah. is the employment agreement that the buyer and the seller agree will be signed and delivered at the time of closing, which again, sort of like when you're buying a house, you're going to sign the agreement usually one day, and it's going to provide for a closing date another day where the parties are going to exchange money gotcha. for a bill of sale for the assets. Sometimes we do what's called a sign and close, which is where the APA that happens at the same time. You sign the APA at the closing. And you know that's not the norm, but it happens not infrequently. And that's really because for whatever reason, from a timing standpoint, the way things came together, we're just going to sign it the same day. So those are important things. You're going to hear these from brokers. And the more words you know about this, the better. We're going to wrap up here in five minutes. My team have some questions here. It's hard for me to see a chat exactly. If anybody has questions, we can ask them. But this is a good one. Uh, you know, I'm a big sign up fan. So what's the deal with DSOs? You know, we, I work with DSOs, you work with DSOs, you do transactions from $80,000 to eight plus million. You know, it's, it's 20, right now as we're recording this, it's 2021. Has anything in the DSO space changed? If someone's listening saying, I don't know much about DSOs, give us a, a minute or two of sort of your, your update on DSOs. I mean, there are more DSOs in the market, um, which is good for sellers. Um, not necessarily good for, some buyers. Uh, the good news is that for the most part, DSOs are buying practices that would be more challenging for a younger owner operator to get financing for. Yeah. They're looking for larger deals. There are some that will do smaller ones as well. But generally speaking, you know, we don't see a lot of competition between DSOs and individual buyers right. for practices. There is a zone where a practice is grossing 1.2 million dollars or so crossover. That, that yeah, they start to it's like the shows from the eighties when the cheers people showed up on growing pain for dating yourself, right? It's exactly yeah, like that. Yes, yes. Yes. But uh, but it's a, that's not just I kind of asked Rob Pond with some you know a positive part of our industry, a painful part of our industry. Positive part meaning where there's opportunities for multiple different types of buyers that buy practices. But what you said there, I think, is true: is that the more DSOs coming into the space. The more interested people are, more interested entities in buying dental practices that might not have existed before, mm -hmm. which sellers have more creative opportunities. I mean, there's DSOs that buy 50%, right? Mm -hmm. DSOs buy 80%. Um, is that something you're seeing? Yeah, it is. You know, and they, they all are different. So when you talk about DSOs, that's not like one uniform thing. It's not like you watch Star Wars, you see that in like Field of Stormtroopers, <laughs> they're all the DSOs. Yeah, yeah. No, they are not yeah. the same. 
The terms of the deals are different, how they're structured are very different. I would, what I would say though, you know, because I think we're really, for the most part, this is a buyer audience and, and people that are contemplating, you know, how they're going to transition into to practice ownership. I would say really be careful about buying into a partnership with a DSO or in the practice where you're an associate. There are a lot of pitfalls there. It's not the same thing as owning your practice. There are a lot of details and fine points about that that could go wrong. And look, I just generally speaking, for the most part, DSOs are hiring people and bringing them on as partners in that setting because they need dentists. Right. And the best way to retain a dentist is for that dentist to have skin in the game. And so in some cases, you're not really becoming a partner in the practice. You're really kind of chaining yourself to the practice. And it makes it very hard to leave that practice and buy something else if you truly want your own. That's uh, such good advice. Practice. And you, you've been an awesome friend and mentor here, but I, I'll make you laugh at that. I now get up earlier in a year. So I say, what makes sense for one person does the other. Mary and I made a 5.30 p.m. reservation for dinner, which I would have been embarrassed to make a decade ago. And now I said, so, so what makes sense for dinner reservation for 40 or 50-year-old parents doesn't make the same sense for 20 and 30. Same thing in this space. Mm -hmm. What makes sense for a 60-year-old working for five more years may make the opposite sense for a 35-year-old. So sure. uh, we've had Dr. Desiree Yazdan on our podcast, and she's just awesome. And she talks about, she talks to this avatar, Olivia. And Olivia is a 35-year-old mom. She lives in California. She might go to yoga. And that's when she post she's posting for Olivia. So I'm going to ask you, Rob, if you're wrapping up saying uh, someone who's been an associate for a few years, thinking about buying a dental practice, you know, where's a positive, where's some positivity, and where's some problems in our industry now? We'll wrap up with that. I think you just need to be patient. You need to, to avail yourself of, you know, the resources that are out there to help you find practices, be persistent, line up the right team, and don't buy a practice for the sake of buying a practice. Be patient and, and wait until you find something that's that's appropriate for you. So it's so awesome because it's a once decision. I was at my practice yesterday. You know, the place where you walk in and dentists, they say, has an enormous impact on your morale, on your money, on your sanity. You've seen these things also destroy families at times and also make awesome things for families. So take this time, wherever you are in career, to prepare where yourself cares. So thanks so much, Rob, for being here with us. How can people Thanks reach out to you? What, what's the best website for you? And how can they reach out to you if they want to learn more? The best way to reach us is uh, yourdentallawyer.com. And you can submit a uh, question there on the, on the web portal. Uh, our email addresses are on that uh, website too, our contact info. So you can email us uh, or call us. If you love texting, you just text law to 215-543-6454. The dentalamigos.com is our uh, co-hosted podcast. We have tons of episodes. Tell people to start an episode one. You're going to learn about brokers, you're about financing, you're going to learn about case acceptance after you buy a practice and more. So this has been an awesome season of how to buy a dental practice.com. Uh, I appreciate uh, Rob, you being here as our finale and now we'll go uh, get some 5.30 PM dinner. Sounds good. Thanks Paul.